Um, hi, uh, I'm the last talk. Uh, my name is Craig. Uh, talking about Protractor. How many of you do Protractor tests? Yeah, that's fine. Not 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 everybody has to raise up their hands. Like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. You know, it's it's uh you know it was introduced in Angular JS. It's not like the newest thing in the world. So I get it. Unit testing is the way to go. Um, when you think about it, you should probably have not as many protractor tests as you should have for unit tests. Uh, you should have a lot more unit tests. Um, so yeah, I am Craig. A uh, little bit about me, I'm a software engineer in the tools and infrastructure at Google. Um, I'm also a co-author uh, for the Testing Angular Applications book, uh, which actually Michael and I are working on with some other people. Um, and there's the cover if you've never seen it. It's really cool. Anyway, whatever. It, it's buy my book. Anyway, um, so so today we're going to talk about uh, TypeScript support with Protractor, uh, blocking proxy, uh, debugging with the Chrome inspector, and then we're going to talk about continuous integration, which is kind of what I wanted to talk about uh, initially. Uh, and we're going to go through like, hey, how do you set up the Jenkins thing, and um, you know how to avoid long end-to-end -end tests. Um, so new stuff. Oh, and here's Protractor. It's it's not something you put in the oven. It's just it tests your Angular uh, and Angular JS applications like a real world user would. So for people that have used TypeScript, everybody's TypeScript. People raise their hand. Okay, good, good. That's good. Um, we're all here for an Angular meetup. Um, so it's good everybody uses TypeScript. Uh, so basically, when you use uh, uh, protractor all you have to do now is just import protractor and just you can start typing and it has the definitions for you um, which is pretty neat so er, that, we're going to go through this pretty quick so I can you know drink more beer um, so so the blocking proxy is uh, so if you think about your protractor tests it, you have your node uh, test which has your test your Jasmine framework and protractor and then you have the Selenium web driver server, at, which has browser drivers. And then you have your application. And you want to con connect these all together. Um, basically, what blocking proxy is, um, it actually goes in between the Node.js and your Selenium web driver. Um, and actually, Michael worked on it. And, uh, and then it goes in between the two things. And, and there's some really neat things that can happen from it. Um, uh, one of one of them is highlight delay. So, like, let's say you are, if you've ever written a protractor test, you hit go and it, or you hit run, and it just goes like flash, 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 and you don't see exactly what's going on, right? It's just a bunch of screens, and it just happens really quickly. Uh, what you could do now is you can use uh, protractor's highlight delay, and you could just say highlight delay five thousand, which is five seconds, and what that will do is it will highlight it in a blue box. Uh, before you click on that element. So it highlights it ele highlights the element, and then it clicks on it, which is pretty neat for debugging and trying to figure out what your test actually did. OK, so I guess we're doing a demo. All right. Man, this is going to be fun. OK, uh, so this actually has to do, um, I have my web manager serve, uh, I have web, web managers uh, running here, which is ju just your Selenium standalone server, so we can, whatever, minimize that. That's just a bunch of garbage that gets printed out. Um, there is an issue with blocking proxy. Uh, so we have to start it up separately. So it's right here. Um, that's how you would start it. Uh, the port number, uh, what the Selenium address is. And we want to signify that, hey, we want to use highlight delay for about three seconds. And then. Um, in the other window, we have I have this thing called blocking proxy, but uh, that's a script in my thing, and that is a protractor run, and it calls my protractor blocking proxy configuration, um, and it has my uh, blocking proxy URL, which is uh, this one with with that with that port, and we want to signify that it's highlight delay. Normally, all you have to do is write in protractor and then your configuration, and then dash, dash, highlight delay, 3,000 seconds. Uh, this is just the workaround for the issue that's uh, uh, that's there right now. So we'll run this. And it doesn't work. Why doesn't it not work? Man, this is this is the reason why. OK, let's try it again. Damn it. Are you in the way? 
Am I in the, not in the, the yeah, yeah, that's where it should be. Yeah. All right. That's because it's not there. It doesn't exist. <sighs> what was it? Protractor, protractor, blocking, conf, JS. Did it type on the first blocking. Was it? <laughs> yeah, I could. Um, do you know what it was called? It was called blocking, blocking proxy. proxy. Oh, what the hell? I'm really bad at Vim. Do not judge me. Uh, proxy URL. Yeah. Space. 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 Uh, okay. Well, all right. So what type on the first one? Okay. And then highlight delay. Yeah, this is paraprogramming. It's it's I, I really had this like wired down and I, I guess I don't know what happened anyway. What was it called? Was it called blocking? Did I just call it blocking? Okay, so let's run that. It was it still blocking proxy? Yeah. You still have a type of Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, clearly, I had this really well prepared. <laughs> it's right. It's right here. You see? It's right. I can't. Obviously, I can't spell. I, I've been working. I worked on Protractor for a long time, and I still can't spell it. So, don't judge me. All right. I think we're good now. It's. Magic. All right, cool. And there's a window. It highlights it blue, clicks it, highlights the input, and types stuff in. And then it's supposed to hit the create button. But I don't know why the create button didn't work. But anyway, it usually works. It's fine. Don't mind this. It's 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 just the feature. I I was told to present this last night. Um, <laughs> so I imagine that's why I live dangerously because I basically created the slides last night, which was great. Another thing I'm supposed to talk about um, is this debugging with Chrome Inspector. Uh, this uses Node 8. Um, I also put this together last night because I was told to put this in. Um, but but it's pretty cool. I actually tried it out. Um, uh, it uses async and await. Uh, and basically, what you have to do is, in your configuration, you just put Selenium promise manager to false. And what that does is it takes out the con control flow. And if you remember the control flow, or if you don't know the control flow, it's a Selenium web driver had their own promise and resolver thing. And uh, this is just to do away with it and just use regular promises. Uh, so basically, what will happen is we'll launch the Chrome inspector. Um, and then we just have to have a debugger flag somewhere in our test. And we should be able to step through our test, hopefully. I don't know. Not, not that the other thing happened. I, I'm pretty sure it's not going to work. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Uh, I have my service running here. Um, we're using that same application uh, complements of our main author who wrote the uh, this contacts list application. Um, now, what was it called? It was called, it's the start debugging thing, and it, it's this node and spec, anyway, it's this flag, and we just run this. And then we go to Chrome somewhere, and we type in Chrome inspect, and it's this inspect thing that comes up. We click on that. And then now we have our beginning of our test. And then we uh, hit play, and we get to the first debug part of our test. So we'll watch it go through. And there's our debugger thing. And we could take a look at it. It's basically in an it block. And we get a bunch of elements, and we click a bunch of stuff. And we have this debugger thing. What is this? Oh, this is pretty cool. Latest post from the Craig service. Cool. Good stuff. Step, step through. Oh, yeah. And then you can step through. And then there's uh, just like normal debugging. You just click over it and hit close. I guess that's what test does. Pretty cool. Uh, again, I prepared this last night um, because I was told to present at least this part. Um, oh, and there's my slide for what could go wrong. 
I don't know. It just just happens. Uh, things just went wrong. What is that? Okay, that screen looks weird. It has the orange on it. Uh, so, uh, who uses Jenkins? Cool. Who uses Protractor with Jenkins? Okay. Well, all right. That's fine. Uh, so, if you want to run Protractor in Jenkins, um, there's a lot of online resources that just say, "Hey, this is how you run Protractor," and there's this huge disconnect. Like, well. I can run Protractor on my desktop, but how do I actually run it on Jenkins where there's no window that I can see anything? And um, in this example, I'm using XVFB. But what you could do is you could also use um, a headless Chrome. And you don't have to even worry about all this other stuff. And that's pretty neat. Uh, so it, if you're going to actually do this, I would just use headless Chrome. Um, what you would do is, you, in this example, install XVFB, which is a frame buffer for to like emulate your or have a virtual environment for your Windows, your, yeah, whatever. Anyway, virtual desktop. virtual desktop. And then you install Chrome. And then we are, we're installing NVM, which is your known version manager. Um, you install, you basically tell where uh, your Java is and your NV or your XVFB in your global configurations. Uh, you would want to do this because you need Java for to run Web Driver Manager to run your Selenium server. Um, and then you need to make sure you have plugins. Uh, so the ones I recommend are the JUnit plugin, which comes with it automatically, uh, the NVM wrapper, and XVFB. Uh, and if you're using Chrome Headless, then don't install XVFB. So yeah, I know this is really interesting. OK. Uh, and then uh, in your Jenkins job, uh, way down in your build environment, you would just say, uh, use Node version 7, uh, start and stop the XVFB uh, for me. Uh, when uh, when the job starts and when it, and shut it down later. Uh, also, uh, I also use this ANSI console output because uh, the output is in green, um, so that it's helpful to uh, see it pass. And then some of the post build actions I have on my on this test is I archive all my uh, outputs for my JUnit tests, and then I basically create a plot, which is that thing which is actually the chapter 10's test for my book. That's pretty cool. Great. Hey, Craig. Yeah. Uh, maybe I missed it. Where was Protractor and all that kind of stuff? It's there. <laughs> uh, it's just just not there. Uh, let's, let's look. I can pull up my, it's my computer at home. Let's see, configure. Yeah, I, I didn't really talk about it because it's just uh, you basically. Uh, I pull down the GitHub repo. I will build periodically because it I don't trigger it, and then I do some exporting for some things on my uh, environment variables. You can't really see that. Um, so I, I do some exports. So my protractor config does certain things on is Jenkins true. Um, I also record the node version and npm version just to make sure I'm writing the right thing. Uh, Chrome version and Firefox version. I don't, I'm don't. i not using Firefox, but uh, I go to the directory. I do an npm install, and I do a run of the configuration. Um, up here is where I talked about you sh uh, starting XVFB. Uh, you don't need it if you have headless Chrome. Um, and then Node 7. You could use Node 8 if you wanted to. Um, and then I, output, I archive my files. And then, then you get these nice plots. Thanks for, thanks for the question. I uh, totally forgot about that. Uh, OK, so I presented this last time um, that there was this guy that had a two hour and 30 minutes. I'm, I don't know why I'm repeating it, but it, poor guy has a two hour and 30 minutes uh, end to end test. And it's actually a really long uh, feedback loop to figure out is your code managing or working properly. Uh, so I actually was, you know, initially I said, well, you know, split your code up into smaller suites and like just go with that. You know, you should be able to run it in parallel on whatever Jenkins on multiple slaves, and that should be fine. Um, and then I started thinking about it a little bit more. It's like 514 specs is a lot of specs. You know, maybe there could be a little, something a little bit smarter. Uh, so I spent last week doing this thing. So I, because the end-to-end uh, -end tests are in the same repo as your Angular test or your Angular project usually, or at least for the Angular CLI, I decided to say, well, if I change something in new contact, 
I would like to run only these tests. Um, and the router it, test is more just like load up all the pages and make sure that you know the, it, it properly routes to things. Um, let's say I run contact details. I want to make sure that I can view the contact detail and I'll, all the pages work. So just kind of like smartly selecting which test to run. Um, so I basically was thought, well, if I could stage the commits and compare it to master, and then I could find the paths that were different in the uh, Angular, in, in Angular uh, source control, or in the source, I could then map it to suites. And from those suite names, I could get a list of specs to run. And from those list of specs, I could wrote, load up the uh, generic protractor configuration, replace the specs, and export the new config, and then run that as my protractor config. Um, so this is my mapping. Um, these are the paths to the repo or to the Angular application. And I have a browning suite and a view context suite, which makes sense. And then on the other side, in this big JSON, or not big, uh, a JSON file, I have this view context suite, and then I just say, um, you know, this is the this is the end-to-end -end test I want to run. Um, it also had the router test, which is not here, but it, it would just run a different uh, TypeScript uh, test spec. Okay, so what does that look like? This I know works. All right, so let's go to our code, and we're just gonna. Type something in. We're going to save it into this contact details um, uh, component, which is in the contact detail re uh, folder. We'll go to our thing. We'll, I guess I'll add, add my script. And then I'll stage it. Make it long. Yeah. Uh, we'll just stage it to the last commit. OK, so it's staged. And then now I can run. What it, what I could do is it would end up doing is it will say a git diff, um, was it name only, and it's like master, right? And it will it will show a list of pack, uh, files that were changed. Okay. So now I could run. Hopefully it's there. What's it called? It's called something else. It's called end to end smoke, because I didn't want to run too many things. Uh, so what it should do is should, should just run the details page and it should navigate from the contact list to the specific contacts detail and just run that test and also load up all the pages just to make sure it works. So here's my test. It loads up all the pages really quickly. And then I don't know why it ran it twice. Is it broken? Oh, it's broken. Who broke it? Man. <sighs> this worked, I swear to God. Like, <laughs> of course, of course things don't work when you do a live demo. Anyway, this this does work. I actually had this running. Actually, no, actually, I know why it doesn't work. Hold on. I totally goofed this thing. Uh, no. I can do this. I can do this. Hold on. Uh, we'll use this. There's an extra slash over here, and I do this. Uh, I do this uh, check, and it has for some reason I, I shouldn't have had a slash there. Oh, we'll load up the main application. So this is the Firebase application. So this should work. So now we're just like looking at the uh, routing, and now we're looking at viewing a contact. And then we can also look at it from creating contact as well to make sure that the view was right. Uh, so we ran a few set of the tests. We only ran 19. I think there are like 40 tests in this suite, so or in this uh, in this protractor test. Uh, so that's that's that was my demo. Thank goodness it worked. And if you want to know more about everything, uh, these are some of the resources I used. Uh, if you want to see a demo of blocking proxy working, uh, this is one of the tweets we did last year. It actually does work. Um, uh, I have a post about Jenkins working in, uh, in uh, protractor working with Jenkins. 
And then this is the Stack Overflow question we were just talking about. Um, and I will have a link or I have a link to the to my code for getting it to run only a part of your test. It does require you to maintain a mapping of like your end-to-end -end test to your repo, but it makes sense. Like you can actually run less tests. And I feel like when you run end-to-end -end tests, they're always they can always become flaky. And you don't want to wait for such a long feedback loop. So you can actually just run part of it. So do you have any questions? Yeah. So if you were doing this process, would you still see value in every so often running all of your tests just to make sure that you're cutting things out if you miss, miss a test? It's going sure. To well. so, so the question is, um, you know, should, should, shouldn't we run all the tests at some point or another? Because, you know, what if, you know, maybe we're not capturing everything with just running part of the tests. Um, yes, you should probably run all the tests every so often. Uh, you can do it in continuous build and set that up and just not, like, let it go and um, let it run once a week or something like that. But if you're going to do development, you want to have it so, like, you have instant feedback, like, yeah, my unit test passed, and the things that I changed more or less passed the end-to-end -end tests. And I'm not running two hours worth of tests. And that's the idea was just to like limit that amount. Yeah. So in our company, we have a QA separate team, and they use Selenium, I think. So they kind of working with us parallel. Right? Okay. Okay. What kind of advice or suggestion for them to switch to work in contraction with developers together? I, I, is, is I, any reason or not? I think you should. I think you should. Uh, work closely with the uh, dev team when it comes to that kind of stuff, because when somebody changes something, you know, then you're like, oh, I got notified that my build broke, like what changed, and it, it's better to be part of the same repo, and and like even with this uh, CLI, it's like here's your end-to-end -end test inside your repo, and and you know some people might say that's not good or it doesn't have to be, but I feel like when you take that snapshot of like yeah I'm going to launch the website. I want to make sure that my end-to-end -end tests pass. Then you always have this truth area where it's just like the IDs are of this uh, or attributes are this. I should be able to verify it with my protractor test. So, I, there is. I, I think there is benefit for your dev and uh, QA group to work closely together. To uh, you know, just it just makes life easy. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you.